we're going to endeavour to do this in 20 minutes, which is ambitious. There should be an S on in the end of this, I think, according to the abstract title. So I'm not just going to talk about culture, I'm going to talk about all cultures everywhere in 20 minutes, which is fine. No, I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. Um, so what I want to do is talk about um, some recent ways that archaeologists have revisited time, especially being a prehistorian, and then ways that we use that to structure the kind of debates that we have and to look at different uh, things specifically and how they fit into our narratives. So I'm loosely hoping to cover some of this. So unfortunately, you've seen a slide remarkably similar to this um, already today. Uh, luckily, <laughs> Hannah's gone. Um, so the starting point for this was reading, rereading the first chapter in Julian's book, which talks about material culture and talks about culture. In parallel with this slide, which you've seen, this image, which you've seen a slightly better presentation in also Hannah's paper, somebody else's paper. And this is, of course, um, Tim Ingold's discussion of uh, this uh, Bruegel painting called The Harvesters, and this is a particularly mid sort of 90s, late 90s approach to time and material culture and archaeological narrative and interpretation. And um, I think it's, it's, it's salutary to revisit previous work in a contemporary setting in the light of new information, and especially how we build our, our narratives about material things and how we inject a bit of dynamism into them because the things that the thing that always struck me from this Ingold discussion is that he introduces this concept of the task scape and the dwelling perspective and that things are ongoing but reading Ingold's description it's it's easy to critique him because he's not here it often feels like um uh, uh, as well as uh things going on things are ongoing interminably. There is no actual punctuated lived human experience in his discussion of this. And uh, uh, maybe I'll come back to this slightly later on. And this is the, the, the context of this re-evaluation in terms of having some new data in the terms of more precise treatments of radiocarbon dates. This is the Belfast AMS up there, if you're interested. Um, and producing new interpretations of archaeological chronological data which might or might not lead to wonderful tomes like this that hopefully um, start to inform our discussions and narratives. And I'm interested in how you get from this new data into interpretation and models of archaeological change. And there's an arrow up there to remind me to point out the uh, Zeno's time arrow here along the top. This is the passage of time, as uh, uh, you were talking about. And so how we get from our data into, and how we situate those data within different models of change to produce interpretation. This is Stuart Piggott's model of uh, British prehistory and uh, a David Clark playing around with a representation uh, uh, in his introduction to models in archeology. span I keep on pressing this because I'm trying to remember. Will you waggle five minutes at me in about? Yes. 13 minutes time. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Right, so this is, this is where we come in. And I want to think, it occurred to me, I did my PhD in Bayesian statistical modelling in this uh, institution, and it was a fulfilling and educational and instructive and creative process, as it always is, of Alex and Alice around here, so uh, I can say that in all honesty. Um, uh, but I was quite interested in how those new interpretations and those new data sets actually got presented, represented in, in narratives. And whether actually our new chronological data could prick, could deflate our pre existing models, or whether we were simply replicating the same kinds of narratives, the same kinds of causal structures and patterns that existed before this. Um, what, in short, is the point in doing all of this? If we can't critically re-engage with these models, and these are two slightly competing models of a particularly boring period of prehistory, um, and it's the start of when some Neolithic, more, on, more of this anon, when some things first appear in the archaeological record and trying to understand the patterns in time and space and build them into a narrative and interpretation, how much does this actually change the strictures and the structures within which we think and work, and if they don't, what's the point? <laughs>
Um, so I wanted to start thinking about culture because that is one of the ways that archaeologists traditionally uh, think about stuff and social scientists generally. And we've talked, uh, we heard Hannah's example of um, Gavin's folded handkerchief of time. This is my crunched up silver foil of culture um, and it is situated culture is situated in time and space uh, um, time and space are the frames on which we hang a, a, our data everything else is just with a massive asterisk culture the just refers to preservation of us, interpretation da -de -da -de -de, all of that stuff let's just deal with the easy stuff first right let's just deal with time and space and culture all cultures and we'll talk about the just uh, in the future more to, yes, culture is, I would contend, what we're actually interested in engaging with. It's the thing that we want to try and approach and understand, personally speaking. But if you define your silver foil of culture, your variability, your human choices individually, groups of people, whatever, if you predefine it on your spatial or temporal axis, then you're skewing your interpretation. You are placing interpretation before your data collection, if you will. Um, and this is quite important. More traditionally, cultures, of course, look like this. This is Piggott's model. Um, model, it is a model. This is Piggott's model of British prehistory. We have cultures where causeway camps and flint mines happen before long barrows, and we have some other stuff going on. And importantly, stuff happens in uh, space and it happens in time. And we know this because that's the way that time works. It's unidirectional, it's linear, it's actually, in this case, teleological, probably. Um, and, and this is what traditionally we interpret, we archaeologists often use as cultures. Of course, this is only one system of understanding time and complexity. There are competing systems. This is the great paleoenvironmental archaeologist Frank Oldfield's undergraduate BA. Uh, I really should tell him he's, I'm using this 40 years later. It seems a little unfair. But what I wanted to put uh, across here is that there are these competing temporal schemes that are dealing with different materials that are dealing, that are trying to make sense of the patterns, really. Uh, but we need to go on beyond that. And what I want to do to use that, to start to do, to approach that, is to start to think about what we mean when we talk about culture equally as contentious as what we mean about when we talk about love but um, for archaeologists. So this is the kind of anthropological basis for um, definitions of culture. This is Edward Tyler's classic statement about culture. Um, a complex whole which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, morals, law, customs, da 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 da, -da. I've highlighted all civilization because that quite often gets cut out of this quote. And the etymology of culture and civilization is important because in early anthropological literature, and in, uh, indeed for a period of time, in English language, apologies to um, friends from other parts of the world, um, in English language discussions, cultural civilization, the terms are used exchange, uh, equally. They can be exchanged one for the other. And the, ba the roots of these words are important. Because when Tyler was using this, culture was more typically understood as raising a crop, a culturing something. There is a temporal process implicit in the early use of that term, as there is in, in civilization, I suggest. And this comes across, this continues for a period of time. Um, the the, the, the um, cultural model is important because it replaces this kind of evil, what Trigger called the evolutionary model of change in human societies. And Trigger suggested this was a paradigm shift. This is slightly contentious in the way that the three age system was introduced to Britain, but nevertheless, the introduction of the term culture represents an important development in anthropological and archaeological thinking. So far, so innovative and exciting, yeah? We're, you know, really pushing culture, guys, it's important. Um, but, uh, so mid-20th century American anthropologists, including the brilliant Krober, emphasised that what culture is not is a list of material traits. It is not a bunch of things that, pre that mean that you do culture A versus culture B. Culture is loosely a synonym for society. This bunch of stuff here does not comprise culture, or it should not comprise culture in our narratives. 
And it's only much later that we have this introduction in anthropological and social sciences thought of a binary opposition or a, uh, uh, an equal and opposite distinction between nature and culture. So the original definitions of culture, I think, are quite important. It has a temporal property, it is not static, and it describes groups of people, not groups of stuff. In archaeology, in terms of culture, when we think about culture, we must, of course, think about Gordon Child, who is glossed as the culture historian par excellence, the founding father of the discipline. And here he is, somewhere in the northwest of Scotland, looking quite jolly, which is good. And in his earliest writings, when Child um, uses the term culture, he uses it interchangeably with civilization, but he also uses it interchangeably with epoch, period, times and age. So this is the start of a confusion in Child's mind um, in terms of what this term means. He, he tries to refine this definition uh, slightly later on when he talks about essentially a bunch of stuff, uh, uh, material expression of t what today we might call a people. This is not unproblematic, as I alluded to earlier, but um, uh, he, 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 he qualifies this term quite often with a spatial definition for a culture. So you not only do some material culture stuff, but you do it in a specific time and a specific place. And in his, his latest writing, he... Um, he, he qualifies this. Child actually becomes less culture historic as he goes along. He becomes more um, subtle and more um, specific in what he's talking about. So he emphasises things um, in his last paper in terms of complication, bewildering assortment, assemblages, bunches of stuff, a significant... And the diversity and the bewildering assortment is a significant feature of European prehistory. Now... I'm just briefly going to segue into time, radiocarbon time specifically. We've had um, several revolutions in radiocarbon dating, and arguably these have led to revolutions in understanding. I think, again, that needs to be qualified slightly. And I'm just going to briefly talk about reactions to one of the previous revolutions by uh, 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 Colin Renfrew um, in his book uh, Before Civilization and uh, David Clark in, for a little bit after this. So Renfrew in 1976 noted that after the second radiocarbon revolution, all that was needed was a couple of ounces of charcoal and science would do the rest. Science, solving your problems since 1976. Don't worry, my friends, we're in safe hands. Um, of course, it did have significant impacts, both in terms of the data that we use and the way that we think about it. So traditional models of the uh, introduction of the Neolithic are demonstrated to be completely um, incompatible with the radiocarbon data. I love this quote from one of Glyn Daniels' students. I remember him walking into a lecture one day and announcing that his life's work had been totally disproved as it was no longer thought there was such a thing as single megalithic culture. That must have been a bad Monday. <laughs> um, but this had a significant impact on how we thought and what we thought about archaeology. Stuart Piggott famously said of the Durant Wards, Walls New Radio Accommodates, these are archaeologically unacceptable. Uh, and later, when Daniel had recovered, he, uh, he said perhaps this was the greatest breakthrough of the development of archaeology ever. Uh, so that's all good. So, so that has a significant sequential shift, sequential shifts in our thinking. In terms of our narrative structure, David Clark's reading of this change was uh, more important, I think. And Clark recognised in his book Models in Archaeology that there are a series of tools, intellectual tools that we apply to archaeological data to think about them, including iconic analogues, models in archaeology, representations. And in his paper that on the loss of in innocence um, in archaeology, Clark recognised that the consequences of methods, their intellectual consequences, could be as significant, more significant than methods themselves. And also critically note, noted that the types of archaeological structuring narrative that we apply to our data and sites are important in terms of the interpretation and the narrative that we produce from them. Um, in short, using something like this influences how you think. It's quite obvious, but it's important and worth 
emphasizing because we're still doing this today and we're arrogant if we think that we are not. Um, and I suggest that these kind of models of archaeological time represent iconic analogues, uh, which should be models that we test but actually become embedded in the... <laughs> meh. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, come in, become embedded in how we think, why we think, what we think. Right. So in Renfrew, we see uh, an emphasis on the sequence, and in Clark, we see the much subtler, more important emphasis on the structure of how chronologies influence our thinking. Right, to the point in hand. OK, so I suggest that as a result of the second radiocarbon revolution, we move from something that looks like this, Piggott's cultures in archaeology, to something that looks increasingly like this. Zeno's linear temporal arrow, where spatial variation is actually dumbed down to a single narrative that has quite serious implications for the kinds of na uh, for the kinds of interpret for how we write archaeology. Essentially, I'm not saying that BBC history is the kinds of prehistory that we do, but it ha does have an arrow in it. So I thought it was worth keeping. And I think that as a result of that even with the new Bayesian modelling techniques that we do. We might be quite good at writing chronologies about site types and about practices that we think that we observed in the past, but we're actually really not very good about writing about the multi-temporality of things and the multi-temporality of people. And it is not ironic, I think it's not, I think it's slightly ironic that the emphasis on materials and the emphasis of, uh, on human relationships with materials in contemporary archaeological theory has decontextualized them in lots of different ways. Rich is looking slightly scowly at me, so I don't know why. No. Oh, right, okay. No, um, so I think that the way that we think about things and sites has implications for what we write. I'm briefly going to talk about some field work that we did over the summer. This is Bryn Kethley D. We dug some holes. Um, there's a nice, series of nice groove web hits which have a cricloidax in them. This is pr presumably an early Neolithic thing in a pit that has later Neolithic material, culture including some pottery. Now, saying that old stuff gets put in to pits later on is not really revolutionary or other negative features in the British Neolithic is not really revolutionary. And I don't think it needs to be. But what I want to contend is that aspects of this thing and its relationships or its expanded um, or contracted series of connections with a wider human landscape, wider human society, means that the nature, the, 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 the history of this thing as part of a cultural repertoire is important. I can't remember which slide's coming up next. Um, this is a view towards the Cricloidax factory, which is on the other side of the Menai Straits, um, where this thing came from. This is meshed into a series of connections, wide, much wider in space and time than beyond this place. So when we think about Charles' definition of culture as bunches of material things, that's all well and good. Um, but I think what we really should be doing with our new chronological tools is re-temporalising individual things as part of group bunches of stuff that people in societies and cultures use. So this thing needs to have its history written as part of this. Um, and isn't that, so this isn't just putting the time in. This isn't just parachuting some your dollop of time on the sides like you put your structuralism next to your Marxism, whatever. This is integral to how we talk about this stuff and integral to the kinds of societies that we write. If we continue to talk about sites and practices, we are only going to get a very partial view of this composite um, interconnected uh, prehistory. Um, and hopefully this is pretty final. But um, this is Trigger's first history of archaeological thought, and he's characterising different archaeologists by their particular intellectual persuasion. So you have um, Assyriologies over here for some reason. Um, you have post there are only three post processualists in 1988. Um, and then you have processualists and functionalists and culture historians. Child, bless him, is both a culture historian and a functionalist. So if that doesn't 
instill some kind of um, in panic. Um, I don't know what does. But what I want to point out is here is, as archaeology is a history of ideas as much as a history of practice, we bring with us all of these associated ideas and stuff. And our kind of, our, our fear of sort of culture history models is, is at one time disingenuous because we still bring a bunch of this stuff along with us, but yet we've abandoned aspects of it that are quite important. Uh, need to be readdressed in the light of the new tools that we have. So, this is kind of my overview of what I thought I might think. Culture, in its original term, and I would suggest still, isn't fixed temporally, it changes over time, nor is it stadial, it changes. Models of change are good to think with, but we need to be critical when we think with them. Abdicating an idea with the, abdicating a concern with the specificity of things, both in time, space, and societies, essentially is historical determinism, and a series of just so stories. And this isn't just about zooming in to different multi-scalar levels of analysis. This is about writing the most complete um, histories, narratives that we can do. So we need to produce narratives of sites and things as well as sites and processes. And this isn't just unpacking the Neolithic package, but thinking about giving objects their times in order to allow us more critical narratives now. Maybe. Do you all come down?